change was about to take place in Hollywood by the end of the 50s. The Paramount antitrust case had broken up the film studio's vertical integration. Before the ruling in 1948, studios controlled the production, distribution, and exhibition of their movies. Quiet! Roll em! In order to ensure the possibility of competing with the studios, the ruling stated that they had to give one of these things up. The studios decided to get rid of the chains of movie theaters they owned that would only screen the films they produced. The loss of these theaters caused the studios to take a massive financial hit. Throughout the 50s, the studios struggled to compete with television, so they implemented all sorts of technical innovations like Technicolor and 3D to get the butts in the seats. But alas, it had little impact. They didn't know it, but this hardship would pave the way for a Hollywood renaissance that would give youthful American artists an opportunity to redefine what American cinema is and share their passion with the world. This is how New Hollywood started. The aim of the Paramount Antitrust decision was to provide small independent producers an opportunity to compete with the big studios, and that's just what happened. Cheaper and more portable filmmaking equipment gave artists a chance to make a film without relying on the money and resources of the big studios. Independent filmmaking in America during the 40s and 50s almost exclusively focused on avant-garde and art films. Maya Darren's 1943 surrealist film, Meshes of the Afternoon. James and John Whitney's 1945 abstract animation, Five Film Exercises. And Kenneth Anger's 1947 experimental queer film, Fireworks, were some of the wider known of these films. Films like these were primarily short and often financed by the artists themselves. Maya Darren even rented out theaters with her own money in order to showcase her work. Following Darren's lead, Amos Vogel founded a film club in New York City called Cinema 16 in 1947, with his wife Marcia, where they too used their own resources to exhibit films. In Cinema 16, the Vogel showed experimental films and documentaries, and eventually films from all around the world, primarily Italian comedies, spaghetti westerns, Japanese films, and French New Wave films. These kinds of films would go on to inspire the aesthetics and practices of new Hollywood films. Hollywood and television are constantly giving us things that we've already seen. The most interesting films are precisely those that show things that have never been seen before or show things in a completely new way. It was around this time that the Cahiers du Cinema magazine started, and many of the writers, who would later go on to make films and found the French New Wave, had begun noticing a trend in the films of certain American directors. These films were unlike the others, they had a personal touch to them. These were the films of Alfred Hitchcock, John Ford, and Orson Welles. All of these films had a cohesive style and thematic quality to them, that showed the Cahiers writers that the best cinematic masterpieces were the product of a single artist's vision. In February 1957, actor John Cassavetes started shooting his first feature film, Shadows. Cassavetes financed the film in part using money he had made with his on-screen work. He would continue to act and would later appear in such classics as The Dirty Dozen and Rosemary's Baby. Shadows was a new kind of American film. It was stripped down and relied heavily on improvisation. The film follows three African-American siblings, two brothers who are struggling jazz musicians, and their sister. The sister is very light-skinned, and the white man she is dating is disturbed when he finds out that her family is black. I don't want you, I don't want you, I don't want you to, to, to hurt my sister. I don't, want, I don't you. want to hurt your sister. Look, 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 maybe I can make you understand what I want no, you yeah, to do. No, I don't want to hurt you. Look, I want you to go. The dialogue in Shadows was mostly improvised, and the cast was made up of students from an acting workshop that Cassavetes had taught a month earlier. After a lackluster first cut, Cassavetes reworked his film and it was met with great acclaim at the 1960 Cannes and Venice Film Festivals. To shoot the film, Cassavetes had borrowed a 16mm camera from a friend named Shirley Clark, who began directing films herself in the 60s. Arguably her most famous was a film titled The Connection in 1961, about jazz musicians waiting for their drug dealer to show up. Like Shadows, Clark's films were a type of filmmaking that hadn't been seen before in American cinema. They had a feeling of spontaneity and reality that Hollywood had shied away from in the past. On the same bill as the final version of Shadows, a short film also premiered at Cinema 16 titled Pull My Daisy, narrated by novelist and poet Jack Kerouac and starring poet Allen Ginsberg. Says, and all this time we should have fed him some food, we should have done, done him good, we should have given all the time you give him wine and beer and give him all these beatniks in the house. He says, I shut up, he says, I didn't do nothing, and you know I didn't do nothing, and it's not bad. These are nice fellows, they're just sitting on, now they're getting up, and they're leaving, I don't blame them for leaving. 
The film was directed by the famous American photographer Robert Frank and captures the essence of the beatnik generation that Ginsburg and Kerouac championed during the 50s and 60s. A writer named Jonas Mikas and 23 independent filmmakers wrote a list of principles in Film Culture magazine titled The First Statement of the New American Cinema Group. These principles stated that they would make personal films instead of product films, that they would not accept losing any creative control over their films to producers, distributors, and investors, and that they wouldn't adhere to any censorship of their voices as dictated by the current policy of the distribution and exhibition channels. At the end of this statement, Mikas famously wrote, We are for art, but not at the expense of life. We don't want false, polished, slick films. We prefer them rough, unpolished, but alive. We don't want rosy films. We want them the color of blood. The revolution had already begun, and the cinematic landscape was primed for a new type of filmmaker, the young film school generation, who would shake things up yet again leading into the 70s. Stay tuned to find out how this man is responsible for introducing some of American cinema's greatest artists. Hey.